the New Horizons probe reached Pluto and Charon in 2015 after a nine-year-long trip. And through that we can understand quite a lot of things about them, and can also at that conclude as to what approximately they were like in the past and what they are going to be like far into the future. However, there are quite a few hypotheses regarding their past and internal structure that arose after the New Horizons visit. So I'm going to focus on just a few plausible ones and with that piece together their past and also the future. So the Sun is significantly increasing in luminosity over the time span of billions of years, which is known certainly through the observation and study of other stars. And even a pretty precise evolution of the Sun can be understood through that by observing stars of about the same mass as the Sun of different ages, which all act in a linear fashion over time because they pretty much all consist of hydrogen and helium and have the same measure of it as well depending on time. So knowing that the Sun is increasing in luminosity, that also implies that the Sun was less luminous when it first formed. Estimates put it at around 70% of its current luminosity. So most bodies in the solar system, after they fully formed and settled into their somewhat current orbits, were colder. Another important thing to note is that nearly all of the significant bodies in the solar system all share a similar age of about 4.5 billion years, and they formed out of the protoplanetary disk that was around the Sun. That age was confirmed through various dating methods. So Pluto as well existed around 4.5 billion years ago. So as the particles of the protoplanetary disk collided and stuck together, the gravitational pull of them grew greater, attracting more particles. Eventually, over the course of tens of millions of years, the main body of Pluto formed through that process. And that body is around 2350 kilometers in diameter, which implies its surface area is about the same as that of Russia. And what formed then was Pluto with an icy shell and a rocky core, even quite early on. And the evidence also suggests that radioactive decay and impacts of bodies heated it enough so that the ice and rock separated into layers and so that the layer below the icy crust turned liquid, forming a subsurface ocean. And that ocean formed really early on as well, alongside significant matter accumulation. The evidence hints that the ocean is most likely water and it likely has ammonia or salt or both. Ammonia is quite common in the universe and both salt and ammonia lower the freezing point of water. So it freezes way below zero degrees Celsius, meaning not a lot of heating is required to make that water liquid. On top of that, water is also extremely common, and there are even moons such as Europa and Enceladus which show the clearest signs of a subsurface water ocean, so much that they spew water kilometers high into the sky at times. And there are plenty of other moons that also very likely have a subsurface water ocean. Now, the separation of matter that happened through heating made it such that the most dense stuff of Pluto, which is rock, became the core, and the less dense stuff, liquid water, came up above it, and then the least dense stuff, water ice, came up to the top. Generally, less dense stuff comes up and floats on top of more dense stuff, which is quite clear with seeing how, for example, water ice, which is less dense than liquid water, floats on liquid water. And that is also why the water ice shell of Pluto is not collapsing into the ocean, it is floating on it. Now, as a side note, liquid water being more dense than solid water is a relatively rare property. Usually, a substance is denser in its solid state. So, since the icy surface of Pluto was relatively quite young at this stage, that is millions of years after it fully accumulated and settled into its current orbit, it also eventually got its nitrogen ice layer with just a bit of methane and carbon monoxide. And that nitrogen ice layer is most likely just a couple of kilometers thick. It still sits on the very rugged but less dense water ice layer, because the water ice layer is incredibly thick and rigid, and there was not enough heat at that point for the solid nitrogen to sink below. The surface back then also didn't have many craters, since it was quite young and very geologically active. It also didn't have as many colors as today, and because of that, its surface possessed more reflective power, as the nitrogen ice was more exposed. The organic molecules that make the thin dark red brown spots on Pluto right now didn't have the time to form so quickly. So 
factoring in the luminosity of the sun, which was around 70% of its current luminosity, and the more reflective surface of Pluto, which means it absorbs less heat, puts the average surface temperature of Pluto during that time at around minus 240 degrees Celsius. But this temperature level also means that when Pluto was at its closest to the Sun in its orbit, even back then, the nitrogen ice on the surface was still sublimating and forming an atmosphere, but to a much lesser extent. Very likely, it was barely visible. At some point, either shortly after the time at which Pluto was fully formed, or before that, Charon also appeared. One hypothesis suggests that Charon formed out of the large amount of debris that was left flying in the orbit of Pluto after a big body impacted Pluto. Another one suggests that Charon formed at a place different from Pluto, and during a certain event they got close to each other, and Pluto gravitationally captured Charon. Either way, Charon is for a moon relative to the body that it is orbiting very large. It has around half the diameter of Pluto. It is also massive enough to shift the barrier center outside of Pluto. So really Pluto and Charon are both orbiting a single point in space outside of themselves. Still, Pluto is quite a bit closer to that point because it is much more massive. So Charon, like Pluto, also obviously underwent serious changes in its appearance as well. After the impacts of the likely collision settled, or after it formed even before that, Charon was pretty smooth, lacking in craters and features that truly distinguish it, such as these ridges, cracks, and the dark Mordor spot. It was also not as colorful as today. The coloration didn't have the time to form so quickly. So because of that, just like Pluto's surface then, Charon's was also more reflective, because the water ice surface was overall more exposed. This coupled with the sun's then luminosity puts its temperature during this time at about minus 240 degrees Celsius, possibly quite a bit lower. And just like Pluto, the evidence based on its current surface suggests that it also separated matter through heating and made an ocean quite early on. Also, we know the general composition of Pluto and Charon through knowing their densities. Fast forward to around a time between 3 to 1 billion years ago, and this is when on Pluto, clear indications of surface cracking are very much apparent. These cracks are a result of the water ice freezing and therefore expanding below the surface. Because water ice takes up more space than liquid water, when liquid water freezes, it expands. And that expansion happening beneath the ice shell cracks the ice shell. However, this is only partial freezing of the water ocean, as many newer cracks on Pluto can be seen at the moment. As the surface temperature during this time was higher, because the sun increased in its luminosity, the seasonal atmosphere on Pluto was more apparent during this time. So mostly nitrogen and some methane and carbon monoxide ice started significantly sublimating during the orbital period in which Pluto was closest to the Sun. Of course, since the temperature on Pluto was overall lower, the sublimation was not happening as much as it is today, so the atmosphere was still quite a bit less dense. During this time, we can expect for the brown spots of Pluto to be visible as well, since as time passed, the methane, nitrogen and carbon monoxide in the atmosphere and on the surface had enough time to be hit by solar radiation, UV light, such that various dark complex organic molecules formed called tholins. The tholins through that process eventually covered the surface to varying degrees. Such coloration when found on bodies in space frequently means it is organic. So essentially Pluto started forming its dark spots during this time. But because during that period tholins didn't accumulate as much as today and there was less solar radiation, the dark spots were not as pronounced. And by this time we can expect for Pluto to have highly reflective nitrogen ice caps, like the Tombaugh Regio. Around the latitude Tombaugh Regio is in. That is because that latitude overall receives the least amount of solar radiation during the course of Pluto's entire orbit. So it is not the poles that are overall the coldest on Pluto. Parts nearer to the equator are actually overall the coldest. That is because of Pluto's high axial tilt. Then because of the lowest annual solar radiation received, the volatile ices, the ices that easily sublimate, are most likely to be significantly frozen there. 
which allows then for an accumulation of those volatile ices. And through a runaway process, as that accumulation was happening, that was also increasing reflectivity. So that spot became colder and colder, allowing for more and more volatile ices to freeze there and over time accumulate. So we can expect for similar looking areas to Tambau Regio to be apparent on Pluto during this time. Some mountains as well were also likely popping up, with the frozen chunks of water ice below the surface detached from the water ice layer. Because of their density, they were propped up to the surface on the more dense but less rigid nitrogen ice. Water ice is the only material on the surface of Pluto that can support such a structure that goes up to 3.5 kilometers in height. And at those low temperatures and atmospheric pressures, water acts more like a rock. It's incredibly rigid, while nitrogen under such temperatures and low pressure is not quite as rigid, but actually has a tendency to flow a lot more. This is also around the time that water ocean of Charon froze and expanded, and that expansion created cracks in these ridges that go along in a line. This entire surface area was impacted the most by that, as it is clear based on crater density that something relatively quickly eroded craters over here and created an overall surface that was smoother and less rugged compared to this part, which likely experienced the same fate but much earlier on. So the more rugged part of Charon is the older one, which is also the reason that it is quite a lot more rugged. The deformations accumulated there after the ocean freeze. And it also has plenty of cracks because of that ocean freeze. Now during this time Charon had an odd look, as on one side there was this heavily cratered and rugged surface, while on the other part it was pretty smooth. This is also the time when the reflectivity of Charon started to overall decrease alongside Pluto as the escaping atmosphere of Pluto was reaching Charon. Models show that about 2.5% of the escaping atmosphere of Pluto reaches Charon, and when it does, some of it freezes and falls to the ground during the colder periods. And when Charon is at its closest to the Sun, so when the temperature increases, the ices that easily sublimate, volatile ices, sublimate and escape, leaving behind only the organic molecules that, by that time, already turned into dark tholins. So Charon started getting its relatively dark mortar spot, but it was quite a bit less pronounced during this time in the past. Fast forward to now, and by this point Pluto has the characteristic Sputnik Planitia in the greater Tambau Regio, the basin filled with clean nitrogen, methane and carbon monoxide ice. The region is named after Clyde William Tambau, the man that discovered Pluto in 1930. Indications suggest that it formed through an impact that created a deep basin that started to then accumulate ices because of a higher surface pressure at the bottom of the basin, which lowers the point at which nitrogen, methane and carbon monoxide freeze. Then that made it very good for the volatile ices to heavily reconcentrate there through a runaway process. And what made it especially good for that is that the basin is at the coldest latitude of Pluto. Also the water ice that got detached from the water ice layer upon impact then was propped up to the top as the basin started accumulating nitrogen ice which is more dense than water ice. And that made those water ice chunks float on top of nitrogen and that formed plenty of mountains that show the indications of being quite new. Some new cracks because of a freezing ocean also popped up as well. The current precise average distance of Pluto and Charon from the sun is 39 astronomical units. So they are 39 times more distant from the Sun than the Earth, and they need 248 years to complete an orbit. The orbit of Pluto and Charon is also quite odd in that compared to regular planets, it is quite tilted in relation to the equator of the Sun, and it is also quite elliptical, so elongated, and that also causes the orbit to not be centered around the Sun, which then makes Pluto and Charon at certain times closer to the Sun than Neptune. With Charon as the indications show, the geological activity stopped some 2 to 1 billion years ago. So this spot which was really smooth is right now a lot more cratered, while the other part is even more rugged. Still some signs of small scale geological activity are still present in form of some cryovolcanoes that spew ammonia and water. <laughs> 
Then, as we move forward into the future, the temperature levels are increasing as the sun is increasing in luminosity. The atmosphere of Pluto then will start to overall get denser and denser as the sublimation rates of nitrogen, carbon monoxide and methane are overall increasing. We can also expect for more dark red organic molecules to start accumulating even faster because of the greater solar radiation. So Pluto and also Charon when Pluto's atmosphere is escaping will both be getting darker and darker over a certain period in the future. Then eventually as the billions of years pass the sun's luminosity and with that solar radiation output will increase and the temperature levels on the surface of Pluto will reach the point at which nitrogen ice will no longer be able to be present in any state. That is when the temperatures start getting at around minus 200 degrees Celsius. This is when a drastic change in Pluto's appearance will take place. The nitrogen ice layer that is most likely just a couple of kilometers thick will start sublimating drastically alongside carbon monoxide. Now the sublimation will be great enough so that eventually after a certain amount of time of Pluto being exposed to such higher temperatures it will be left entirely without a nitrogen ice layer leaving the water ice beneath the nitrogen ice to be exposed and it will be left without a long lasting atmosphere at all during any season since Pluto's gravity that is 16 times weaker than the Earth's is far too low to be holding on to that sublimated nitrogen at those temperatures. Nitrogen is also not a very heavy molecule. So on top of that, the solar winds from the sun will easily be able to blow off that gas nitrogen, as Pluto doesn't have a magnetic field to protect its atmosphere from solar winds. However, a relatively short term, denser than ever before atmosphere during the great sublimation and escape phase of nitrogen, when Pluto starts getting at those higher temperatures will likely be present. Now the reason that Pluto is able to hold on to a thin atmosphere at the moment is because it is extremely cold on Pluto right now even when it is at its closest to the Sun at 30 astronomical units. Then it is about minus 220 degrees Celsius. So not enough gas nitrogen molecules get to reach escape velocity but a lot of nitrogen still sublimates allowing for a buildup. But that atmosphere is largely but not entirely gone once it is at its furthest from the sun at 50 AU as then the temperatures dip to roughly around minus 240 degrees Celsius and the nitrogen gas molecules then just freeze largely. So during this entire massive evolution of Pluto's surface Charon actually won't be experiencing anything too drastic since its surface is composed of water ice and water ice starts sublimating significantly only at temperatures of around 0 degrees Celsius. Unlike nitrogen which starts significantly sublimating at temperatures of roughly about minus 200 degrees Celsius. So Pluto and Charon at a certain point in the future will both be composed of water ice on the surface and both will entirely lack an atmosphere. Still Charon will look quite rugged at that point as its surface will have plenty of craters accumulated and not eroded. But Pluto will have a newly exposed water ice surface that is relatively smooth. Likely some water ice blocks that were on the top of nitrogen ice, the mountains of the past at that point will then be forming water ice mountains again on the water ice surface as they get lowered down to the ground over time as nitrogen ice is leaving. Also quite possibly Pluto will still have a substantial ocean even that far into the future provided that it didn't freeze entirely by that time as the thick water ice layer could still shield the ocean then and leave the ocean unaffected from the large changes happening at the surface. So possibly even that far into the future Pluto will still have quite a bit of geological activity. Eventually after the sun has entered the red giant phase when it reaches a runaway point in fusion acceleration at some 7 billion years from now then it will start to inflate its outer layer greatly and this is when things get more uncertain for Pluto and Charon. So the Sun will grow in size by inflating its outer layers through increased fusion and as that is happening it will also be losing quite a bit of mass as fusion will be occurring much faster but at the same time the mass loss from the Sun that follows because of that will decrease its gravitational strength leading to planets moving outwards in their orbit 
Now, before the Red Giant phase, the mass loss wasn't as significant to cause some drastic orbital shifts. So this is when the mass loss is significant and a good deal of orbital shift will happen as a result. So two factors control the total solar output. The surface area and the surface temperature. Now yes, the sun's surface will go down from about 5,500 degrees Celsius to about 2,900. But its surface area will also be about 37,000 times bigger than it is now, which will make the sun's solar output about 3,500 times greater than it is now. The reason that its surface area will cool down, despite the increased fusion, is because the heat from the core will be spread out over an enormous distance. A distance that will compensate for the increased fusion, such that the surface area specifically will be colder. This also relates to my previous video, The Past and the Future of Titan. So even saying that there will be more mass loss from the Sun than likely, which would make Titan move outwards quite a bit, and even putting the Sun's solar output at a lower plausible end, I can still be quite certain that Titan during the Red Giant phase, at its peak size, will make the temperatures on Titan extremely high, way higher than 0 degrees Celsius. However, Titan for a brief time before the peak size Red Giant Sun will enter the habitable zone. But eventually the habitable zone will certainly fly by outwards and Titan will be heated enormously. But for Pluto and Charon, the scenario during the peak size of the Sun is quite a bit different. So they are much farther away from the Sun than Titan is. And the estimates for their orbit distance during the peak size and the absolute luminosity of the Sun, even if they are just a bit off, could have drastic impacts on their surface evolution. Because they are right at that zone where during the peak size they will either be in the habitable zone or just a bit outside of it, inwards or outwards, which then means the temperatures could either sublimate entirely the water ice of Pluto and Charon or not. So I'm going to assume that the mass of the peak size red giant sun will be about 20% less than it is today and that the general solar output is going to be 3,500 times greater than the current suns, which is plausible. So the distance of Pluto and Charon from the red giant sun will then shift to be on average 53 AU and not the current 40 AU. The lesser gravitational strength of the less massive red giant sun will cause that drift outwards. Then the red giant sun from the average distance of Pluto and Charon will appear about 4 to 3 times larger in the sky than the moon and the sun currently appear from Earth. So this means that Pluto and Charon will reach temperatures higher than 0 degrees Celsius. Which means that all of water ice of Pluto and Charon is going to go away through extreme sublimation and then the very strong solar winds of the red giant sun will blow off that gas water easily off of their surfaces, eventually leaving only the rocky core left. Water ice is about 30% of Pluto's total mass and of Charon's it is about 40%. We have those estimates through knowing their densities. This means that Pluto will lose about 30% of its mass and Charon about 40%. Quite relatively suddenly, Pluto and Charon will look completely different. They will have relatively smooth, newly exposed rocky surfaces and their diameter will be by hundreds of kilometers smaller. Still, they will both be massive enough to maintain their spherical shapes. But because Charon will lose more mass than Pluto, Pluto will get closer to the barycenter. Now this all also means that the geological activity of Pluto will be entirely dead, as that was driven by a subsurface water ocean, and the water ocean won't survive those temperatures. And this also means that the newly exposed, smooth surfaces of Pluto and Charon will just be piling on craters from that point into the future. And then there certainly won't be geological activity that could be eroding the impact craters to any significant degree. Then after that event, the Sun will reach the helium flash, and during a short time span, it will release a large amount of energy, shedding its outer layer, creating a nice looking nebula out of that, but also leaving behind only the very dense core that is not undergoing fusion. White dwarfs are relatively tiny. The Sun white dwarf will have the diameter about that of the Earth, and a mass roughly 200,000 times greater than that of the Earth. Now despite the fact that the surface temperature of white dwarfs is much higher than that of red giants, 
it is around 20,000 degrees Celsius compared to around 3,000 degrees Celsius of red giants, the around 300 million times smaller surface area of the white dwarf sun compared to the red giant sun will still make the solar output of the white dwarf sun be about 200,000 times less compared to the peak size red giant sun output. So essentially, quite quickly, the temperatures on Pluto and Charon will go from pretty hot to within few Celsius degrees away from the absolute zero. On top of that, as the mass loss from the outer layer shedding will be quite large, their orbit from the sun will drift further outwards. So from their surfaces, the white dwarf sun in the sky will appear tiny, and not a lot of photons will be reaching their rocky surfaces, making them also pretty dim. Now the white dwarf phase of the sun is by far the longest, with estimates of its lifespan ranging from a couple of hundreds of billions of years to a trillion years. And as those years will be passing by, the white dwarf sun will be running out of stored energy, releasing less and less light. Pluto and Charon will be getting dimmer and accumulating craters. Their surfaces will get extremely rugged. Quite possibly, when some bodies from the extremely cold parts of the solar system get to them and hit them, they will also again start accumulating some ices. Eventually, the white dwarf sun will begin to crystallize and turn into a brown dwarf, and the last photons from the sun will eventually be emitted, which will reach the battered rocky surfaces of Pluto and Charon, and afterwards they will be left nearly pitch black with temperatures near to the absolute zero. 